Hi, Roxburg Central. I'm going to just kind of give it a sec for people to tune in. Um, also, this is my first live, so I'm going to totally do this wrong. I know it. Um, but the purpose of this live today is that it is World uh, Against Trafficking Day on July 30th today. Um, so I have been kind of acquainted with A21 and the work that they do, and they are a anti-trafficking organization um, that I've been slowly getting to know. And uh, today I have the opportunity to talk with Katie and Gil, who are the country managers of the South African uh, office. So they're gonna kind of give us some insight as to the organization and human trafficking, especially right now during COVID. Um, it's really affected that industry. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a brief reason as to why I really like A21. Um, so uh, they are global, they're not just local, they're international, um, and they really help the victims um, afterwards in the aftermath as well. Um, and I kind of got acquainted with them because I, I personally just think that um, it's human, it's, it's, humans have the right to have agency over their body and when they don't that is, that is devastating not only to them but to the societies that they're a part of. Um, so I really, really am fond of this cause and the organization and yeah, I'm going to explain it terribly. So I'm going to invite Katie and Gil um, to be a part of the conversation. I'm just going to ask them questions. I'm kind of coming at this from a learning perspective. So anyone listening, uh, we're on the same page here. Um, but yeah, so let me see if I can add them. Told you, I'm gonna do this completely, completely wrong. All right, hold on. Katie and Gil, I can't find you for some reason, so I'm gonna ask that you request to kinda jump on here with me. I'm still not seeing you guys. Uh oh. Oh no. Is it A21? Am I? No, um, we'll just we'll just put it down to we'll, we'll let um, people I know it's jump late on. over there, so <laughs> I appreciate it. You cut out. Say that one more time. No, we just said we'll put it down to we'll just give people more time to jump on and join us. So. <laughs> that's what you were. Yeah. Well, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pardon. exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you guys again for coming on and um, taking the time to chat. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a privilege that you you would have us to come and uh, have right. a conversation about this. Yeah, yeah, we so we so pumped and yeah. excited about it. Yeah. So, Kate, okay, I know that you. Um, I I know that you've been a country manager for A twenty one for a while, and I'm guessing Gil, you're you're a part of that as well. Yeah, awesome. she's she's my boss. So, I am. so. <laughs> boss. Um. So why don't you? Uh oh, we froze again. Why don't you guys you tell me a little bit about A twenty one? I know this connection is going to be funky the whole time, but um, yeah, tell me a little bit about A twenty one. What you guys do over there in South Africa, but also maybe globally as a um, as an organization, um, and just kind of start there. 
Great. Well, um, we're a global anti-human trafficking organization, obviously. Um, we're actually 18 operating countries, 18 operating offices in 13 countries. So we've grown pretty rapidly over the last 12 years um, and have 10 operational countries. So 10 of the countries that we run actually work directly with victims and assisting victims. Um, and then we have a, an approach where we, um, it's a three-prong approach that we have when we're working with victims of trafficking. I don't know, Gil, did you want to explain that? Yeah, so our strategy uh, as A2NY globally is, um, our operational strategy is uh, reach, um, rescue and restore. And the way it works is um, the reach is we reach the vulnerable and we disrupt the demand. Um, and, that's, and that's basically educating and going out and doing presentations uh, within schools, especially in our vulnerable communities. Um, we, we have a, a, an agreement with the educational uh, department here in, in South Africa in the Western Cape, um, where uh, what A21 does is part of the curriculum. So that's really awesome. We have a great reach coordinator who's working tirelessly and, and really well with government. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have uh, Rescue, which is um, where we, we, we partner with law enforcement, um, we partner with government and other NGOs um, to, to obviously rescue victims of trafficking. Um, and we also, as 21, run the National Human Trafficking Hotline here in South Africa. We also have in Bulgaria and Greece. In yeah. Greece. Um, but here in South Africa, we, we um, as a to run that. Um, and we, in which case, we'll probably talk about a yeah. little, bit, little bit more. Um, and then finally, uh, the rescue, where we walk, walk a long-term journey with our survivors. Um, and it's where we, you know, we're able to, um, you know, to provide access to, you know, to education, um, access to, to, you know, uh, to have medical access as well, um, and health. Restorative Rest services, yeah. yeah. Basically and walking a road of, of crisis to independence, yeah. you know, once they've been rescued. And yeah. so, yeah, those, those are the operational strategies that we work globally um, as an organization. I mean, that sounds very hands-on, like from start to finish. So that's really, really cool to, to hear. And so you mentioned you guys go into schools. So like, why do you guys think it's important to start educating that young? Or, or what is the age that you guys kind of do start educating at? We educate from any age, actually. We've done presentations for as young as four and five-year-olds. Um, you know, we've got some great primary school or, you know, um, between the ages of five and 12 that we do. And we honestly believe that education is key. It's yeah. one thing to work with a survivor of trafficking, but that's years of rehabilitation. You're, you're working against so much trauma that's come, come against them. But imagine if you could reach someone who's vulnerable before they're trafficked. You could yeah. teach them, what does trafficking look like in your community? How do I protect myself? How do I protect others? Or how do I recognize it in my community? And so I think that's for us is why prevention is so key. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of reading a little bit and, um, you know, kids are less likely to, to call you guys themselves and they're less likely to reach out themselves. So the fact that you guys are kind of educating that as young as, like you said, four, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so how did you guys kind of find your way to A21 and how did you guys, you know, what, what makes this organization special to you guys? Um, well, we always joke that Gilbert married into it because we're married and I was already working for A21 at the time. So he felt like he didn't have a choice. <laughs> he didn't have a choice. Um, but I found out about human trafficking when I was just finishing my university degree. I studied occupational therapy. And in South Africa, there's a large community focus in occupational therapy. You look at disability of community, the things that make people vulnerable. And that really stood out to me. And I was sitting in a women's meeting, actually in Australia, and I found out about human trafficking. I heard Christine speak about something and I was like, I can't believe this happens. And I can't believe it happens in my country. And that yeah. really spurred me to get involved and learn how can I use what I've done to actually make a difference in my context. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree completely. I mean, the fact that it does, you think about human trafficking and you think that it just happens overseas when you're, when you're not educated on it and you realize it's happening all around you um, and you can actually stop it. I mean, the, the Can You See Me campaign yeah. about that, um, like you have the ability as just a pedestrian or a random person to be able to spot it and identify it and help. And I think that's really cool that, that you guys are kind of, bringing awareness to that, that you yourself, you don't have to just like write a paycheck to the organization. You, you can like identify it in plain sight. Um, so I think that's, that's really, really cool that you guys are doing that. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's 
That's awesome. Actually, um, I'm so glad you mentioned Can You See yeah. Me? Because I think I'd love to, to point people towards that campaign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a lot of people feel, I don't actually know what I'm looking for. I don't know what I'm looking at. What would I even do if I saw a victim? And right. I really want to encourage people to, to have a look at our Can You See Me? campaign. It's basically local scenarios of trafficking in uh, various different countries. We've got the campaign for Mexico. We've got it for South Africa, the UK, USA, Thailand, and soon to be some other parts of Latin America. So, you know, you can actually learn what trafficking looks like in your context. And then there, within the scenarios, there's actually a way for you to do something. So it's usually reported. In South mm -hmm. Africa, it promotes the hotline that we run, the national hotline. In the USA, it promotes NECMEC and the Polaris hotline. So knowing, you know, being able to know who do I call if I see something, I think, you know, you, you can't go wrong with educating yourself. So I'd love to point people towards that Can You See Me campaign. Yeah, and I'll put the resources for, you know, um, the number and the, the hotline and all that stuff that you mentioned kind of in my link. Awesome. Um, but yeah, what was I going to ask you guys? Yeah, well, why don't you guys talk a little bit about the different types of human trafficking and just, just for people who are completely new to this conversation, um, because I think people kind of think of human trafficking as, you know, the sex industry or, or something specific to that um, mm -hmm. crosses a bunch of areas. So why don't you guys kind of briefly just talk about that? Yeah, I think I think that's a that's that's a great question because I know some of us have had and have our own understanding and perception and ideas of what human trafficking is, um, which is why conversations um, like this is important because it's vital to bring in awareness of what actually human trafficking is. And you know, human trafficking is basically the illegal trade or the buying and selling of a human being for the purposes of exploitation. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know. These traffickers use human lives as a commodity, mm -hmm. um, you know, so they would treat them as if you're going down to, to the store to buy, the local store to buy a loaf of bread or a milk, uh, uh, you know, a carton of milk. But, you know, the, the difference is, you know, the, your bread and your milk, once it's consumed, it's, it's, that's it. Whereas human life, you can, you can exploit over and over and again. And that's probably one of, one of the reasons why a lot of these traffickers, you know, um, exploit um, these victims of trafficking mm -hmm. because, there's more to it. There's a, you know, we always say there's, there's high, there's a low risk, but high reward in this. Yeah. That's what, so, you know, it's so luring to, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, there's three common, um, you know, uh, forms of trafficking. Um, as you mentioned, one of them, sex, sex trafficking is one of them where, you know, women are, uh, and children, even men have been exported, you know, to service clients, you know, if, you know, really? throughout the, yeah, through the day over and over again. Um, and, you know, labor trafficking is another one where, you know, they've come you know, for a job opportunity and the circumstances are different. You know, they've come here and they just realize that it's not what they signed up for. Mm -hmm. And so they're exploited in a way where they're working for, you know, almost you know, little to nothing. And, you know, one of the, the third one is, um, is domestic servitude, which is something that we work a lot with in South Africa, yeah. um, you know, because the vulnerability and the opportunity to come from, um, you know, your uh what's the word rural communities, Your rural communities yeah. into into the city um and it's you know you just put in a place where you know you, you have to work with little or no pay again but you have no um you know you have no control to go anywhere yeah. you, you pretty much stuck in there and so to actually just yeah. bouncing off of that domestic servitude is such a common type of trafficking mm. everywhere and it's one of the hardest to identify because yeah. it's exploitation in someone's private home so right. it's almost you could see it as someone's personal slave or household slave. So it's a person that I'm working in a private home. If I never leave the home, maybe no one will know I'm there. No one will be able to report that something's going on. Whereas labor trafficking, sex trafficking, you can often see on the outside. So those are the common types we work and that we see, we see globally. You guys froze, but I, I think I caught most of that. Um, and I think people don't realize that, yeah, it, to be trafficked doesn't mean you have to go somewhere. You, it, you can be in your home country. You can be, you know, exactly. down the street and being trafficked. So I think that's super important for people to identify. Um, so I guess maybe let's talk about how the vulnerability of COVID has kind of put a lot of people in worse situations than they were in before and how that might have affected um, trafficking. And, and if you guys have seen an increase in stats or calls or whatever great so that's a really interesting question how does COVID impact trafficking 
I honestly don't think we're going to know that fully until we have been through this season and we start to see right. the ripple effects as we go. Um, I can tell you what we have seen in the States. I know the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have had something like a 90% increase in reporting for online mm. exploitation in this season of lockdown. That is intense. So maybe where you would have seen trafficking taking place on the streets, now there's far more happening online. So we really believe that COVID has pushed a lot of the exploitation online and made children highly vulnerable. In South Africa, our hotline actually went up in calls by about 130% in the yeah. first month of lockdown here, which we didn't expect at all. But I think people slowed down. They were at right. home. They started looking what was happening around them and they had time to report what they were seeing. But on the flip side, we've actually seen a decrease in in the capacity of law enforcement and government to respond because of COVID. Yeah. So it's, right. it's almost this people are reporting, but the capacity to respond is lower. And so we definitely are seeing it's far harder to, to see rescues in certain contexts. Um, and definitely this underground crime has been pushed even further underground with the, with the regulations. So it's popping up online, it's going further underground. It's, it's very complex. Yeah, because I'm guessing people, first of all, in this day and age, maybe don't trust law enforcement. And law enforcement is very busy with a bunch of other things giving COVID. Um, so how do you guys, what advice would you give to people trying to identify online trafficking? Like, what, what should they look for? I mean, um, it's probably in common places like Instagram and uh, YouTube and TikTok, like, the, the, the big media sites, I'm sure, are getting a lot of that. So how do you guys... Uh, what advice would you give to identify any of that? Right. So I think the first thing to know is if you see exploitation happening online, don't share the videos. Don't share yeah. them. You're actually re-exploiting victims if you start to share exploitation that's happening online. You need to report it. So within your country and your context, you need to find the hotline to report it to. If you jump mm -hmm. on the A21 website, a21.org forward slash call, it'll take you to the different hotlines for the countries. But I can tell you in the USA context, you're going to be calling NECMEC. And you're going to be telling them what is actually what you're seeing online. And they're going to help to, to identify um, what's going on there. Um, so that's the first thing. Secondly, I, I would, I would yeah. love to push you towards the Can You See Me campaign. Yeah. There's a, an online child sexual exploitation video. It's actually based in the UK. And it's a real life scenario of, of a young boy who was trafficked through a video game and was exploited through a video game. And that scenario will just blow your mind and show you how easy it is for a child to be recruited and what to do about it. Yeah, because I'm guessing right now with kids being home and stuff, they're online far more than they used to exactly. be. Probably specifically in a lot of ways. Um, so I think that's really cool for any parents that might be checking in on this to just a little bit more towards that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So within South Africa, like what does human trafficking look like? Or is it more just kind of reiterating the same things that you guys have said? Um, did you guys want yes. to talk about that at all? Or? Yeah, great. I mean, I think that the common thing to understand with human trafficking is that it's um, the common factor with any victim is vulnerability. So anybody in any sphere of life in any sector of society could fall prey to human trafficking. Obviously there are things that render people more vulnerable. And a vulnerability is something that could be yeah. used to control you, such as desperation. Yeah. You know, if you are from an abusive home or an abusive situation, that may be the vulnerability that drives you into trafficking for lover boy method. Right. If you are desperate to put food on the table to feed your family, mm -hmm. a need for a job and a quick job that pays well could be mm -hmm. the thing that makes you vulnerable, a false job that lures you into trafficking. So, you know, within South Africa, 54% of our population are vulnerable to falling prey to trafficking. That is a, a crazy 54%. Yeah. yeah. And we have about 155,000 slaves at any one time in South Africa. That's an estimation. Uh, yeah. So when you're looking at those vulnerabilities, you're realizing how, how traffickers actually can just use that desperation, whether it's because you have a lack of job opportunity, a lack of education, you are desperate to put, put food on the table, you come from an abusive drug, um, drug addicted home, so yeah. your support services are low. Those are all things that render people vulnerable to be trafficked. So I think it's important to know your context and it's important yeah. to know your communities, what are the vulnerabilities in your communities, and you can trust that the traffickers are preying on those vulnerabilities in your communities.
the connection got kind of wonky. Just repeat that last part one more time. I'm so sorry. No, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's it's that the, the traffickers will prey on the, the vulnerabilities from your context. So know yeah. the vulnerabilities in your context. What What is it? Is it um, lack of education? Is it lack of employment opportunities? And you can be sure that the organized crime rings will be preying on that. And that's where you, you, know, you target your awareness. And that's how you can recognize trafficking in your scenarios. Yeah. I mean, in the, in the years, um, the eight years that you guys have been a part of this organization, what's, it, was there one person specifically that has impacted you or uh, one situation that really shocked you um, that anyone tuning in can, can hear about? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a few. Um, I think there's, you know, there's stories of hope that I think we can share, which would be awesome. But maybe one that really stood out to me um, was actually, it's actually depicted in our Can You See Me scenario of domestic servitude. And I'd love to encourage everyone to go and watch that one in South Africa, domestic servitude. A young girl from an African country um, was recruited by someone she knew and trusted very well, a spiritual guide, if you want to call it that. And um, she came to South Africa thinking she was going to study law. She thought she was going to be studying in a great university. And when she got yeah. here, she, she didn't. She was kept as a household slave. She was abused so badly. She actually left her, her situation when she was rescued with a disability. She's had to have so many operations to correct, you know, the, the abuse that happened to her. And now you come as a wide-eyed 18-year-old with all the hopes and, and dreams in the world, and you leave jaded, disabled, yeah. and four or five years later, not having studied and having to rethink, what am I going to do with my life? How do I adapt to my life now? I think, you know, when you... When you realize that, that, that human trafficking, it's not just a, it's not just a buzzword. It's not just a, a thing that, that happens. It's, it's people's lives that are being devalued. They're being used. They're being exploited for somebody else's gain and, and what that actually does you know, to a person. So I think that story always sticks with me um, to remember um, about the one and the hopes yeah. and the dreams of the one and how when you work with the one, you can actually yeah. help them you know, to see their lives come back to restoration, come back to, to independence and living out their dreams again. I think, I think that's, you know, that's kind of what keeps yeah. us going. I, I would say, for, sorry. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, I would say for me, at that same scenario, that same, you know, that same story, um, but when we're shooting the Can You See Me um, a, a campaign film um, in, for that specific um, uh, uh, video, um, we, we had a scene where the actor actually, you know, he had to really get into it. And then straight after that, he walks out and, you know, we stand up, we walk in with him and he takes this deep breath. And then, you know, I kind of said, what are you, is everything okay? And he's like, I just, yeah, that was too dark for me. I couldn't, I can't believe that. Yeah. I'm just acting out what someone's actually living. Um, yeah. And, you know, for, for me, that moment was like, oh, wow, we actually get to be part of something that could actually make a difference and they could actually see someone um, restored, you know. Um, someone's dignity restored and so yeah that was that was probably, that was powerful for me as well and I do I think it's important to share stories like that about the specific people because it isn't just an overall blanket statement like we're helping yeah. you the victims of human trafficking it's specific individuals like it, and kind of what you were saying you just have to be vulnerable and meet the wrong person at the wrong time like it is that mm. easy it have to be overseas it is your local community sometimes mm. Um, and, and I'm sure every person, you know, watching this and you and I have all been vulnerable at one point and had to lean on someone. And exactly. so just the wrong person could, could, you know, this, this woman was left with disabilities. Like it changes your life forever. So yeah. um, I do think it's incredibly important to, to remember that they are individual human beings. Going with. Um, I guess my next question would be for, um, just anyone wanting to kind of help more or learn more or get involved. Like I know you've mentioned the, can you see me campaign? Are there any other ways that they can, um, you know, look into things and research? Yeah, great. Um, so I think there's a number of ways that people can get involved. Um, and that really depends on, you yeah. know, where you, where you kind of sit, what you want to be doing. The, I think the first way that people can get involved is fundraise. That's obviously the, you know, the, the first thing that we would say is fundraise. If you have the ability to host a fundraiser or to become a, a monthly partner, like that is incredible. You're basically putting resource in the hands of those on the front mm. line. And it's actually the ripple effect of that right. is, is absolutely incredible. But that's actually just one of the ways to get involved. I think the, the second thing that I'd love to encourage everybody is get educated. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. Gil was talking about reach and the campaigns that we've got. You know, jump online. If you're a parent, check out our parent guides. Look at how you yeah. can educate your children. Especially in this time. Especially in this kids, time. You know, yeah. Yes, yeah, like how do how do you talk about human trafficking? How do you know even to young children? How do you explain the concepts to them? How do you keep them safe? You can you know if you have if you're a teacher and you have access to students, um, why not download the education campaigns and do that you know with your classes? So educate right. yourself because with knowledge you're actually empowered to make an impact and to make a difference. Yeah. Um, you don't know you're not going to do anything about it. The more you know, the more you can do. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I think um, the big thing that I'd love to say is that on the 17th of October, we usually have our walk for freedom, but obviously right. there's a global pandemic. So big crowds is not going to happen. So we've you know, pivoted. That's our kind of keyword for the season. And we are doing what's an incredible global freedom summit on the 17th of October. Yeah. And that's basically an hour free summit that you can join into and learn about human trafficking globally and actually just have physical tools in your hands to make a difference in your specific community. So um, check out the, um, the A21 page because I think on the 17th of August, we're officially launching that and you can get involved. Um, and then lastly, if you do see something, report yeah. it. You can never go wrong with reporting it. You know, I might see something strange in my community and I pick up the phone, but I'm afraid that maybe what I have to say, maybe yeah. the police won't act on it. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not a big enough tip off, but you don't know that three or four other people have actually called in the same street corner yeah. or the same dodgy house or the same scenario. And you're actually putting power in the hotline call specialist's hands, in law enforcement's yeah. hands to step in and do something and actually save a life. So if you suspect it, report it. Awesome. I mean, I would keep you guys forever if I could, because <laughs> this is super like interesting to me. But, yeah, this is great. Um, I know that it's late. You probably want to go to sleep. But if there's anything else you guys want to just say to to the people left watching um, before before I say goodbye, is there anything else you guys? Uh, I guess actually one more question that I have would be. Um, People, I feel like I've come across people who, who feel hesitant to fundraise because they don't know where the money's going to be or what it's going towards. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone is curious about the fundraising and just wants to know like, okay, but where is the money going to go? Could you guys speak to that at all? 100%, definitely. I think the thing to do is to read our Freedom Report from the last year. Um, it's online. You can find it on our website. And you can actually see the specific yeah. impacts um, the, the lives reached, the rescues that have happened, specific stories in each of our countries, we've highlighted what's going on there. And so you can see the actual impact of, of what's happening. You can rest assured. Another way is follow our social media accounts because we keep you up to date on what we are doing. So maybe we're not saying, oh, this dollar was spent on that, but you're actually seeing what we're physically yeah. doing in, in, in the different countries and you can actually see you know, um, what, what's happening. So um, I think those are the, the two things that I would say, but that Freedom Report is beautiful. So. Go, download it, read it, learn about what we're doing. And I think, I think you'll be really inspired and encouraged. Awesome. Well, I'm going to provide, I'm going to keep the live um, visible to people. And I'm also going to provide all the resources that you guys kind of chatted about in my, in my bio, but um, thank you again for chatting and Thanks, it was great to meet you guys. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So lovely to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, you know, I this think um, it was really awesome. Awesome. Yeah, it's so much fun and it's such an inspiration. You literally take what's in your hand and you, yeah. you influence people in your community and your sphere. And I think that's an inspiration to others. So, yeah, I think people can learn from that. It's awesome. Well, hopefully we get to actually meet in person one day. But That'd be fun. Yeah. yeah, come over. Come check what's going on in here. We'd love to have you. <laughs> I've been to Johannesburg before. I went like over 10 years ago, but it's, it's really beautiful over there. So I would love to come back. Yeah. You, you got to come to Cape Town. You got to come to Cape Town. <laughs> Joburg's, jo, Joburg's awesome. But, Cape but you got to come to Cape Town. Okay. Done. Done. Well, enjoy okay. your night, you guys. And thank you thank again. Thank you. You too. Talk Cheers. to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.